introduction. A composite material, also called a composition material, or shortened to composite, which is the common name, is a material made from two or more constituent materials with significantly different mechanical or chemical properties that, when combined, produce a material with characteristics different from the individual components. The individual components remain separate and distinct with the within the finished structure differentiating composites from mixtures and solid solutions. The new material may be preferred for many reasons. Common examples include materials which are stronger, lighter or less expensive when compared to traditional materials. Since the physics of composite materials are multiscale, Multiscale modeling is needed in order to approach behavior of the full model. In engineering, mathematics and computer science, multiscale modeling is the field of solving problems which have important features at multiple scales of time and or space. In mechanics, multiscale modeling is aimed to calculate material properties or system behavior on one level using information or models from different levels. On each level, particular approaches are used for the description of the system. The following levels are usually distinguished. In this research, we use multiscale modeling in order to achieve homogenization of the material. The earliest attempts to calculate and predict the effective properties of heterogeneous materials were anal analytical. Analytical mechanics use calculus, with differentiation and integration at every step. This is characterized by the employment of certain functions of a set of variables that describes the state of a system in the necessary detail, but not beyond that, and by the use of variational principles as the fundamental statement of, of theory. A typical variational principle might suggest that a certain integral takes an extreme or stationary value for the actual motion, or that a certain algebraic expression vanishes for an arbitrary variation in the state of the system. The variational principles are used to derive the algebraic and differential equations that must then be solved to determine the motion of the system. The beauty of this theory is in its generality and symmetry which was of uh, inestimable value in the development of quantum mechanics and relativity as outstanding examples. The earliest attempts to calculate and predict the effective properties of heterogeneous materials were analytical. Voigt made the first attempt of calculating analytically the properties, assuming a homogeneous strain field, internally of a small unary representative sample of the material thus making it suitable for models under axial loading. Later, Reus followed a similar path, but assuming a homogeneous stress field in a representative material sample, thus suitable for models under forces vertical to inclusions axis. Selby created a more sophisticated model assuming infinitesimal, infinitesimal homogeneous interactions. Because of the rising demand and use of composite materials with varying inclusion percentages, because of the complex inclusion geometries, and finally because of the use of different kinds of inclusion simultaneously in the same matrix, a new method of prediction, calculation of the properties of such materials was sought. The numerical method, having no constraints in the aforementioned, was deemed suitable for modeling the microstructure of complex, complex composite materials. The first modeling attempts were models of a single inclusion in two phase composites, not taking into consideration interactions between inclusions. Later on, the three phase composite was developed, in which the inclusion was positioned in a matrix ring, which in turn was positioned in a ring of the homogenized material, the latter considered of infinite width. In this research, a numerical method of calculation of the composite material's mechanical properties is presented. This method permits the development of a thoroughly realistic model, 
with an extremely large number of inclusions and with a realistic uh, dispersion in space. Methodology. The goal of the modeling is to predict the material's behavior at the macroscopic level using information from smaller scales. A homogenization method is successful when the macroscopic response of the heterogeneous composite material is the same with the homogenized material response. For the purposes of this research, the so-called periodic geometry algorithm was used. Periodicity across surfaces means that continuity between adjacent RVEs is ensured. The way this is achieved is that inclusions in the RVE that intersect the cube's outer surfaces are cut, with the remaining inclusion being placed as continuing from the opposite surface, as shown in the figure. Additionally, the algorithm takes into account a minimum separation distance between the surfaces of any two inclusions. This ensures that the desired uh, volume fraction is more effectively achieved and that fiber dispersion, dispersion is more realistic. <coughs> as far as positioning of the inclusions within the RVE is concerned, the first attempts were guided towards the use of specific phi and theta angles. This method had the following drawbacks. First of all, there was no possibility of uh, positioning a large number of inclusions with different uh, orientation. Secondly, the geometry of the resulting model was not so much realistic. Later on, there was uh, an attempt of uh, positioning uh, the, f the inclusions in a random position. The orientation tensor provides an efficient description of fiber orientation using the probability curve. With the application of the random orientation tensor algorithm, it becomes possible for each individual inclusion vector among a multitude that are positioned iteratively in the matrix cube to have its own position and orientation. Its inclusion is positioned in space according to a probability of convergence to the x1, x2 and x3 axis. In order to achieve a higher randomization of the placement of inclusions in the three-dimensional cube, the following values were used for the orientation tensor. With all other components, left us no. In the left figure, the created microstructure geometry is seen as it as is displayed in the ANSA software environment for the case of the aforementioned tensor values. To calculate the effective modulus of elasticity of the composite, the microstructure undergoes six types of loading. For the analysis solution, the PLC solver was used. Its loading type enables the calculation of the effective properties in its direction. This calculation was obtained from the averaged stress-strain tensors. In the red arrow figures, we can see the three tensile loadings that are used for calculating the effective tensile modulus of elasticity in these three axes. For example, in the first tensile loading, in the x-axis, the effective tensile modulus of elasticity of the x-axis is calculated. Accordingly, in the second tensile loading, the effective tensile modulus of elasticity for the axis y-y is calculated, and for the third tensile loading on the z-axis, the effective tensile modulus of elasticity of the ZZ axis is calculated. For the three figures on the right, 
we can see the three SEER loadings from which the SEER modulus is calculated. This is a figure of our model's geometry in the ANZA preprocessor. It's a three-point bending pre-cracked specimen. The boundaries are shown in blue and loading in yellow. Special emphasis was given to the creation of the mesh for the elements uh, near and around the crack tip. Due to the fact that there is a large concentration of stresses in the, at this point, the elements there must be indeed very small. Moreover, a radial arrangement of the elements in this area helps stress flow to be remain realistic. In the figure we can also see the point where we measured the crack mouth opening. Data. For characteristic values of the multi-volt carbon nanotubes modulus of elasticity, we visited a paper investigating their properties from the same era as the experiments. This was a research done by Yu Lowry et Ali. Here we can see a picture of the three-point bend in flexural test picture and uh, a diagram of the three-point flex specimen. The nanotubes selected were of a, a sort, aspect ratio of 700, a diameter of 20 to 40 nanometers and a length of 10 to 30 micrometers with a purity of 95%. The specific surface area was measured at 110 square f uh, meters per gram. As an example, here is a plot of uh, the experimental results for, for the sort fibers with a volume fraction of uh, 6 per mil. So, how did we apply uh, our generalized methodology for the purposes of this research? First of all, we had a matrix uh, with uh, a cement paste with a modulus of elasticity of 4000 MPa. Uh, in this part of the research, we used only the salt fiber experiments, uh, and we had uh, volume fractions of 6 and 12 per mil. First of all, we select a uh, carbon nanotube uh, Poisson ratio, the highest one. The highest one we found in literature was uh, 0 0.45. Then, from all the carbon nanotube uh, modulus uh, elasticity data we found, uh, we select the lower one, which goes to 35 gigapascals. Afterwards, we calculate the homogenized material stiffness matrix. matrix <coughs> uh, this is, uh, as we mentioned before, the on the homogenization, homogenization methodology. We make use of the represent representative volume element and the random orientation tensor. Then we model the pre-cracked specimens uh, using the homogenized matrix and simula simulate the experiment. We measure the crack mouth opening displacement and compare that with uh, the crack mouth open displacement found in the experimental results. If uh, the difference is larger than uh, 3%, uh, then we go to a check
check against uh, the higher value uh, of the modulus of elasticity we found for uh, our carbon nanotubes in the literature. <coughs> and uh, if uh, we haven't yet exceeded that, which we haven't of course for the first time, uh, we increased the modulus of elasticity for the carbon nanotubes and uh, we repeat the process from the RV homogenization down and uh, you can see this is our first loop which ends uh, the moment we reach uh, uh, either uh, a very small uh, difference between the analysis CMOD and the experimental CMO CMOD or we exceed uh, the 475 gigapascals uh, boundary. Uh, exceeding that, a second loop comes into place, uh, which has to do with the uh, Poisson ratio for the carbon nanotubes. Uh, we started with 0 0.45 uh, we lower it <coughs> and then we we begin the same uh, process with uh, every time we lower the Poisson ratio we have an inner loop that has to be done again the one with uh, the modulus elasticity and this loop, loop uh, again ends uh, if <coughs> the difference between the analysis CMOD or the ex and the experimental CMOD drops below 3% or if we reach again a non-realistic value for the Poisson ratio which uh, results having followed uh, the methodology presented the uh, modulus of elasticity for the carbon nanotubes that uh, consistently gave, a, uh, gave us the uh, results uh, closer to the experimental ones uh, was uh, the value of 470 gigapascals. This means that for every loop of the Poisson ratio it started, uh, let me remind you, at 0 0.45 and we started lowering it the internal loop that has to do with the modulus of elasticity of the carbon nanotubes always uh, gave us the gave us the close uh, results to the experimental walls uh, for the value of 470 gigapascals. Uh, the same thing happened both for the six per mil percentage for the volume fraction and the twelve per mil percentage. So in this figure you can see how when we lower the Poisson ratio for from 0 0.45 to 0 0.17, the blue and the green uh, lines, we come closer uh, to the experimental results. Whereas when we lower it again from 0 0.17 to 0 0.10, we, we come closer but the rate at which we do uh, is insignificant, is really, really small. For the internal loop, the first loop that is, the one that has to do with the modulus of elasticity for every Poisson ratio value we choose, uh, the same thing happened uh, both for 6 and uh, 12 per million volume fractions and for every Poisson ratio we chose uh, as the modulus of elasticity value uh, rises uh, the um, our results come closer to the experimental ones, ones. Uh, but again uh, the more we uh, uh, the more we raise the value, uh, the lower is the ratio at which we we come closer to our uh, uh, 
uh, experimental values. So, uh, as we mentioned before, the <coughs> behavior for 12 per mil, for a 12 per mil volume fraction of the inclusions, is very much the same with that uh, of the 6 per mil. This is the corresponding uh, diagram for uh, stable modulus of elasticity for 70 and uh, the Poisson ratio changing. And this is for a constant uh, Poisson ratio with the modulus of elasticity of the carbon ion tubes uh, changing. So for a comparison uh, of our results, here is a chart showing uh, the crack mouth opening displacements for uh, 6 per mil and 12 per mil for the experimental results, which uh, are the blue ones for 470 modulus of elasticity, 470 gigapascals, for 335 and Conclusions. First of all, uh, at the end of our methodology, we reach uh, an equation that uh, describes the E effective of any similar composite to our own that has the same materials but with uh, any inclusion volume fraction we choose. Secondly, if you remember, there was uh, a 3% chosen for the difference between the uh, analysis CMOD and the experimental CMOD. This is, of course, kind of arbitrary. We may be as uh, precise as we want to. We, of course, want to reach the same identical value with the experimental ones, but that is not always possible. <coughs> so, which is the optimal point? that uh, each loop should, uh, should end. Uh, this has to do with uh, the accuracy we require and or with the available computational power and time we have at our hands. But of course, it may change, it may become lower indeed. As for the maximum value of the modulus of elasticity for our inclusions and the Poisson ratio of our inclusions, that uh, of course also depends on what we consider realistic and that may change as well. The same methodology we used here may be used to model any composite of certain uh, parameters with known matrix properties regardless of uh, the inclusion shape, uh, geometry, and uh, properties, even with uh, combinations of uh, different inclusion types. This means that beginning with the same ma matrix, we may use the same methodology for as many uh, different types of CNTs, of inclusions, uh, with uh, any geometry, any mechanical properties, and any volume fractions we choose. So what happens if we uh, do not know we or what kind uh, of inclusions exactly we have? The loops in our methodology allow for calculation of the composite properties even with unknown, with unknown inclusion properties. 
meaning that uh, as long as experimental data are available, the methodology can still be applied and uh, during its steps permits the estimation of the inclusion properties. This uh, stands true if we have only as one combination of uh, uh, inclusion mechanical properties, volume, fraction and uh, uh, geometry, but may also stand true if we have more as long as some of those parameters are known. If no parameters are known and we have a multitude of different types of inclusions with different mechanical properties and uh, volume fractions and geometries, then we, we only reach an uh, effective of, uh, of the total. In uh, such a case uh, where a researcher or an engineer in considering, considering the use of various combinations of inclusion materials and or inclusion geometries and or inclusion volume fractions and or matrix materials, this methodology may be applied in the reverse constraining the design properties the composite material must exhibit in order to be suitable for the application. Where density is a factor, it may be used for the exclusion of those combinations that do not meet uh, the constraints. Thus, a uh, cost-effectiveness analysis comparing the various composite combinations is easily performed. For example, uh, on the first line here you can see the methodology as it was applied in uh, this research where we have a known matrix uh, with known mechanical properties and uh, the same thing stands true for the, co the inclusion properties and the inclusion volume fraction and we reached an uh, uh, E effective but on the second line, where it could be used in reverse, we constrain ourselves with the, the uh, E effective we want our composite material to have, and then choose uh, a matrix, and we choose uh, an inclusion uh, type, and we can still reach uh, a volume fraction we, we need in order to, to reach our, uh, the desired uh, effective uh, composite properties. Uh, 